Then phase three is from January 16 and massages will be open. Massage! Yeah, I want to go. <laughs> to the massage. <laughs> legitimate, by the way. It has to be legitimate. What's yeah. legitimate? Uh, legit, well, what, what, what isn't legitimate? You tell me. Nah. <laughs> What do we do with them? You know, do we want backpackers? Yes or no, because with them, they are more prone to risky behaviors, be it promiscuous sexual behavior, be it drug consumption uh, and so forth, which are not necessarily desirable in the host country. But at the same time, they do spend money. The article with the clip bait. Clit. (laughs) (laughs) Clit bait. Oh, Hello and xin chào. This is the Bureau Podcast. I'm Matt Cowan, the Bureau Chief and your host. Thank you for joining me again if you're a regular listener. Yes, we do have some. Or if you're a first timer, thank you for finding us and taking the time to listen in. We really appreciate it. I know I say this every week, but we have a ripping show for you today. As well as the usual Ho Chi Minh City news, Dr. Nuno Ribeiro, our expert travel commentator, is back. He was on the show a couple of weeks ago and our ratings went through the roof. So we've got him back to talk about backpackers and to address the seemingly vexed question in tourism and hospitality circles at the moment, should Vietnam welcome back backpackers once travel restrictions ease? There you go. I didn't think it was such a hotly debated topic. So stick around and hear what one of Vietnam's leading researchers into tourism and hospitality has to say about that. Now, someone probably best described as a flash packer, kind huh? of a next level Ooh. backpacker. Flash. If you <laughs> And if she were a suitcase, I think you can <laughs> guess who it is now, she'd be carry on baggage. It's none other than the Bureau's content manager, Melanie Kasul. How are you, Mel? Hey, I'm good. But, you know, since the lockdown, I've gained a few kilos. And I think you need to check me in the next time we <laughs> go right. to travel on a plane. <laughs> Pay a little bit extra. Yeah. Hey, uh, did you ever get to mm-hmm. do some backpacking when you were younger? Uh, no. Not no. really. No, no. It wasn't a thing growing up in Manila in the 90s. You know, we didn't have gap years to get a schedule in for traveling between high school and university. No. Plus any traveling we did was mostly done family style, uh, paid for obviously by our parents. (laughs) And when you were studying, you were mostly a full-time student. Well, most of my friends, we were full-time students. And if you did happen to have a a job as a part-time student, then that's not for travel money. That's actually to pay for your university. So we didn't really have that luxury, no. So not even travel domestically? Uh, Yes, but with family, family. yeah. Okay. And waiting, just sitting there like a bag left at Tunson Yut baggage carousel (laughs) after a red-eye flight. Right in the centre of Ho Chi Minh City, in the red zone, is our intrepid co-host, Andrew Tran. How are you, Andy? What up? One more week till we see if lockdown gets lifted or the goalposts get bended. <laughs> <laughs> so how far apart are those goalposts at the moment? I don't know. It, I mean, we're all supposed to be lifted on the 15th and then what happened? You yeah. know, we've got, extended got extended again. Mm. Yeah. So how about you? Did you ever go backpacking? Not when I was younger, um, probably, you know, I mean, when I first came to Vietnam, I did a little bit of backpacking because I, I like doing solo trips every once in a while because you get to swap stories with people and you get tips. But yeah, no, what about you guys? Yeah, well, back oh, a while now, uh, mm. around about 1999, I think, I backpacked a little bit through Thailand, Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam, as it happens. Uh, So that was a pretty amazing experience. That Mm -hmm. was probably my first backpacking experience. How long did it take you to Uh, go to all those places? At that time, I think I had about six weeks. Wow. I can't really remember why. I think Mm. I was living in Tokyo at the time and Mm. I was teaching and it was around about the time of what they call the Golden Week. Oh, Golden uh, Week, yes. It's similar to uh, Tet. Tet or yep. the Lunar New Year, but it's in April. Mm. Um, and so the whole country shuts down for the holidays for okay. about a month or so. So I uh, flew into Thailand, 
went around Thailand a little bit, went across to Laos, Cambodia, of course, at some stage. Yep. Uh, saw the, you know, the, all the sites there at the time and then Vietnam. So I flew into Hanoi. Mm-hmm. And then at that time, I don't know if you can still do it, but you could buy a bus ticket ah. and you held on to that ticket for the duration of your stay. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was good. It was like a get on, get off. Yeah. Um, and so I went from Hanoi all the way down to Ho Chi Minh City by bus. And uh, yeah, that was an experience. So that <laughs> took about two weeks. Well, as I mentioned in the intro, we have Dr. Nuno back. He's I, back. Yeah, I interviewed him during the week and he had some very interesting things to say about the future of backpacking in Vietnam. But before that, guys, let's warm up a bit. Time Out magazine recently released the 37 best cities in the world in 2021 mm. list. Is this an online magazine, yes. Time Out yep. Online? The list was compiled from 27,000 online voters who were asked not just about food and culture, but also mm-hmm. about community projects, green space and sustainability, and future planning in cities around the world. Now, I'm happy to report that six cities from East Asia and Southeast Asia made the list. Wow. Any guesses for which cities in our neighbourhood bagged a spot? No. No. Is there there sustainable green space in Vietnam? I doubt we made the list. Okay. At number 37 was Bangkok. Number 27, Beijing. (laughs) (laughs) Ni Number 24, Singapore. Hello, la. (laughs) Ni Number 20, Hong Kong. Also, Ni Number 17, Shanghai. Ni hao again. And number 10, <laughs> Tokyo. Hello, Kitty. Oh, is that what they say? <laughs> oh, is that what they say? <laughs> no, I was going to say moshi moshi. But okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh, anyway, there's some awesome cities in that mix. I've been to four of them. Oh. Uh, what are your thoughts on those guys? Are there any, are they all worthy entrants or mm. do you have any others that you might recommend? Singapore, of course, it seems mm. like in everyone's journals list, mm. uh, Bangkok, you know, it's really <laughs> LGBTQIJSKLMNOP <laughs> plus friendly. Um, Tokyo is always a cool place. Yeah. And uh, Hong Kong, love that place. Um, yeah. But probably not the best place. Mm. You know, I like KL, Kuala Lumpur. You know, I wonder why it didn't make the list. You know, there's lots of parks, open spaces, green mm. spaces, and the suburbs, you know, um, just the suburbs Outside KL, you know, there's quite a number of Mm. good communities there, restaurants. Awesome. Well, of late, we've been in a kind of listicle kind of mood. Mm. And off the back of the best cities in the world list we just talked about, I thought we might put together a list of the best streets in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm, And that can go on our website, thebureauasia.com. So you can choose a street for, say, food. Mm-hmm. then one for bars, then one for restaurants and so on. It's up to you. Okay. And then, as I said, we'll throw it up on the website uh, when someone gets around to doing it. <laughs> what do you think? Good idea? Yeah. So between the three of us, let's sure. come up with three each. All Who right. wants to go first? Andy. Uh, Alphabetically. Right on, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So place to eat, I definitely recommend this little head called uh, some seal. And it's in D4. It's Super local, super cool. Yeah. There's a church there, it's religious. Yes, really, really that's fun. right. I always have my boom, boom wheel over there, and it's really, really nice. Super authentic again. Yeah, uh, great, I want to take street. someone out to a yeah, yeah, great street. Um, and it's cool. Actually, just getting there is fun as well, right? If you're into that super local, everything's sort of cramped. You know, there's no real road, pay, mm, yeah, hustle and bustle on a Friday night. Super cool. In terms of bars, I, there's a place on Wimbledon King. Uh, which is called ATM. Oh, and yeah. It's like an old whiskey bar. That's cool. you got to go through an ATM. Which is really cool. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah. There, yeah. 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 And then for restaurants, look like, you know, there's all these high-end restaurants. Matt, Mel, you know my off-camera or, or you know, pre record <laughs> you know my feelings towards some of these restaurants. So it looked like, yep. you know, I think I think one place that I think is local and it, it's a really nice balance between value for money and taste mm. is this place on B1 called, in Coba called oh. Mr. Lee Steak and Pasta. Oh, haven't been to that um, one. Super reasonable price. Yeah. Like saying Noki is amazing. It's oh. amazing. So you guys check it out. Um, and rumor had it, the chef kind of learned secret. 
uh, from a non well known <laughs> Italian restaurant. Ah, so an apprentice. You want something? Learned yeah, or stole? <laughs> no, maybe he uh, apprenticed. Well, you know, uh, yeah. replicate, I like to say. Okay. Okay. Hey, where is Gorbuck Street? Uh, Gorbuck is close. It's in D1. It's like close to the border of D1 and D4 where the river. Uh, ah, right. Okay. Oh, ah, good to know. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Great wow. tip. Yeah, yeah. Never been there. Yeah, I haven't been there either. Yeah. What about you, Mel? What um, are your selections? So my first choice is Calumet Street in the on the border of District One and District right. Four. So right where Andy lives uh, yeah. in the Nguyen yep. Thai Bin area. So it's an eclectic um, area where you have combination of local and more global eats. So you got things like Vietnamese street food that that starts off like at 5 p.m. all the way until mm. the morning yep. um, to a Singaporean chicken rice joint. There's actually like two Singaporean, you know, chicken places there. So one that's a little bit local and one that's actually owned by a Singaporean right. guy. Uh, to French style burgers yeah, and right, French yeah. style yeah. chocolate. There's you know? so much around yeah. that area. Yeah. yeah, but obviously it's a it's a wait and see, like yeah. the rest of the city. If yeah. those places that makes Calmet Street um, a great place to visit is still there for bars, I'd pick Pham Viet Chan in Bintan District. So mm. before COVID, it was getting a reputation not only for becoming the new Japanese ghetto in the city, yep. you know, with the sake bars and some karaoke joints, but also it had a few lo local joints uh, with cheap beers. And, you know, they, they kind of look like trendy cafes, like very into the nostalgia decorations. Yep. So, yeah, th that, that got a lot of young clientele. From uh, expats yep. to, to young Vietnamese. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a great little area. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think those were are my two choices. So not really three, another, just two. Okay. All right. Yeah. If you think of another one, let me know. <laughs> okay. So, uh, my first. Oh, wait, wait. Oh. Uh, so, can I do a shopping street? Yeah, you can, you can do that. All yeah, right. Well, of obviously, we've got a really long street. So, from District 1 to District 5. So, it ah. just goes through. Uh, and that is um, Win Chai, right. Win Chai Street. Good choice. So lots of shopping, but maybe only for Asian size. Definitely. I've, yeah. uh, when I first came to <laughs> Saigon, um, I drove the length of that street a number of times looking yeah. for a pair of jeans. No, <laughs> no chance. No, 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 no feet, I, no yeah. feet, too big, too big. I got turned away turned away many <laughs> times before I'd even got off my motorbike. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Those are my three choices. Oh, okay, awesome sweet. Uh my first street is uh Chan Hung Dao Street. I love mm -hmm. the whole street, but for this list I'm going to say Chan Hung Dao Street in District 5. Mm, okay. So it's right in the heart of the district in Chinatown. There's food and there's history. Now, something interesting is that the water park on Chan Hung Dao Street. Do you know that one, Mel? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. there's a uh, a cafe there with a lot of fish. Yeah, that's as right. Well. Yeah, 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 and there's a water tower there. I think it backs onto Volvan Kit Street in District Five, mm. and it's the site where Indochina's and uh, by many reports Asia's biggest casino was in the early 1900s. Oh wow! Yeah, and it was called the Grand Mond. Now it's interesting that the water park that's currently on that site is called the Dai Te Yoi Water Park. Dai Te Yoi means great oh. world in English. Ah. And in French, that, of course, is Grand Mon. Le Mon. Le yeah. Grand Mon. Don't forget so the Le. It's fascinating that a location once associated with gambling, and let's face it, drinking and prostitution as well. Which, oh, and ballroom dancing. Yeah, which incidentally <laughs> I'll, I'll mention in a moment, it's retained the same name, um, even though it's about families and clean living these days. Mm. So who would have thought that? Also, right across the street somewhere, which, by the way, was called Sailor's Street or <laughs> Rue de Marine or something like that Ooh. in French, was also Asia's largest brothel, uh -huh. the house of 500 women. Is it still there? No, no I don't <laughs> think so. But I, I'm not sure if the building's there because okay. I can't pinpoint it. I haven't yeah. seen it on yeah, maps or sure. anything like that. So, yeah, this city is built on gambling, drugs and prostitution. We built this city. Yeah, what do you think about that, Andy? Good times back then in the 1900s? Uh, yeah, if you had money. <laughs> if you were the prostitute, it's a good, it's a good back then. I don't know. Um, also a bit further along was the Arkansas Seal. 
uh, which mm. means rainbow in oh. French, I believe. Um, was it an LGBT community? No, not back then. I don't oh. think so. Oh, I don't yeah, think yeah. So. No. Okay. Um, it was a former dance hall and restaurant, but now it's a hotel of the same name, mm. uh, different building. The Arkansas was frequently mentioned in Graham Greene's Quiet American. Oh, yeah, the book. That That's book. right, yeah. yeah. And then further on. This is a really long street. Yeah, oh, it's an amazing <laughs> street. That's why I chose it. Further on, right at the end of Chan Hongdao Street, is St. Francis Xavier Church. Ah, oh, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, so if you've been down there, you will have seen this church. And it's where South Vietnam's president, Ngo Dinh Diem, during the, the Vietnam War, or just before, sorry, uh, around about, yeah, around about then, in the 60s, was grabbed by the scruff of the neck and frog-marched mm. into custody. Yeah, that was in 1963. Wow. During the military coup, then he was assassinated the next day. Mm. Now, there's a small plaque on the pew where he was allegedly sitting at the time of his arrest. And yep. I've sat in that seat and I swear I felt a tap on the <laughs> shoulder too. <laughs> oh, it's a haunted church? No, but it's kind of creepy, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Like there's a plaque there. People go there to worship and then there's this sort of historic marker there. Anyway, the second street I want to include is Vin Khan Street in District 4, a.k.a. Snail Street. Oh, yeah, it's very popular yeah. with the backpackers as our uh, topic for today. It's uh, probably the most famous street for snails in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm. And if someone says they want to take you for snails, it's yeah. likely they'll take you to this street. Um, although you can get snails pretty much anywhere in mm. Ho Chi Minh City. Is the service at these restaurants slow? Uh, no, it's pretty <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got me there. <laughs> does it? Does the food come out at the snail's pace? Well, the last time I was there, I went into my shell. But uh, <laughs> it's quite a longish street. Um, it's shaped a bit like an S, and it's located not far across the canal from the backpacker area of Pham Nu Lao mm. and Bui Vin streets. So, um, you know, backpackers, uh, yep. yep, keep that in mind. And the other thing I like about the street is that at the other end, it runs into the major street that runs through District 4, and that's called Tondan Street, which is packed with street food. And mm. uh, Andy mentioned the area oh, before, yeah, yeah. actually. Did, yeah. it, that street that he mentioned um, is near there. Through it. Yeah. Uh, it's just a feast for the senses, and it's just so worth getting down there. And finally, my third street is something quite different and unique, and that is Haughty Gee Street. Um, it's a neighborhood in District 10. Well, it's, it's a near, street and a neighbourhood. It's also near District 5, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a, yeah. it's just across from the Hotel Equatorial. And so um, the street that runs by Hotel Equatorial mm. is the boundary of District 5 oh, okay. and District 10. Yeah. Try and work that out. Oh, yeah, Hung Vung Street. Yeah. It is, yeah. So it divides the two districts. Now, Holti Key Street is well known for its flower market. It's quite impressive looking as the sun sets and mm. the lights come on. But the other interesting thing about this small neighbourhood is that it's home to the local Khmer community. Ah, so, is, oh, this is where they went. Well, many the, of them wound up here after they fled Pol Pot yeah. in the late 70s and early 80s. Mm. Yeah, so there's some small Cambodian stalls there um, or Kampuchea as it's known in Vietnamese. Oh, yeah. Um, they, they sell food from fish from the Ton Le Sap Lake in Cambodia, I believe um, pre-COVID. They would get fish deliveries daily. Oh, like from imported fish. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, on the buses because there's a lot of buses that come back and forth mm. across the border. There's also really famous noodle soup dishes and one is called uh, Bun Nuk Leo that's eaten widely in Vietnam down in the Mekong Delta. And even Ban Cot Kampuchea that's pretty wild. It's made with coconut milk, fish sauce and chilli. They're little flavour bombs. Usually you'd associate Ban Kot with uh, Vung Tao. But in the Mekong Delta, they have okay. their own. Yeah, oh, yeah, they have a Khmer style. Mm -hmm. So it's really good. Wow. Anyway, you won't go hungry there. No. <laughs> For, have you been there, Andy? Any of the streets? No, I haven't. No. I, I'm, I'm really interested in taking notes as we speak. <laughs> or I could just go onto the bureau and feed it there. <laughs> <laughs> good man. You're learning. 
Well, COVID-19 remains the biggest news here in Ho Chi Minh City still, with the number of cases in this wave now reaching over 660,000 as of today, according to VN Express. Oh, it's getting tiring. Yeah, there's been some uplifting news, though, this past week, with the worm indicating daily new cases appearing to have turned downwards, which is great to see. Ho Chi Minh City has the lion's share of cases with over 326,000 and almost 13,000 deaths. Nevertheless, Ho Chi Minh City residents, especially in District 7, Gu Chi and Kan Yo, received good news this week that we're allowed to go out shopping once a week and food deliveries have recommenced. Yay! Yeah. The authorities also released an economic recovery plan this week as well, incorporating three phases for recovery, starting a couple of days ago, the 16th of September, and running into the new year. Now, during phase one, green card holders. Wow, that sounds so American. They are. Yeah, the green card. Yeah. They have two doses to be, sorry, to be eligible for a green card. You need to have had two doses of a vaccine or recovered um, from covid six months ago. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you, if you've recovered from COVID, that means you already have the... The, uh, the antibodies. Yeah, or whatever. the antibodies. Yep. Okay. All right. So anyone with a green card will be allowed to participate in all activities except uh-huh. karaoke, discos, bars, massages, on-site catering services, amusement parks, sports facilities, cinemas, <gasps> malls, all the good stuff. Oh, wow. So no dates, no dating, Andy. <laughs> but in the malls, what if the grocery store is inside the mall? I'd imagine it's not open. Or they have a separate it? entrance to go straight into possibly, the grocery. Possibly. Okay. Mm. Wow. Uh, yellow card holders. I believe that is at the moment just a negative test so to it, qualify for it that. It doesn't indicate whether or not you've got the first dose. I... I actually don't really know. Okay. I don't know the details of it. Andy, do you know anything about this yellow card? Is like a penalty card or something? Yeah, you, you can kind of go out, right? Um, I don't know. And I think I, I suspect yellow card is also you, you receive the first shot. Yeah, that, that oh, was right. what I thought too initially. That okay. makes sense, doesn't right. it? Perhaps uh, one yeah. shot and a negative test. Mm-hmm. Phase two will be from October 31 to January 15 which will allow green card holders um, access to shopping malls, sports centres and small-scale catering services under 20 people. I don't understand this catering services. Is this another word for restaurant? I think it might be because bars and restaurants will be, it seems like, will be one of the last places to open. So this is like a new terminology? Well, I think it might be... I think it might be trying to cover this situation where perhaps, say, a bar is not allowed to open. But they have a restaurant attached to it. Or a restaurant or some kind of venue Mm -hmm. needs a bar. Like they don't have Mm. an actual bar in their premises. Uh, This is, um, you know, this is really interesting. I I wonder how many businesses will change their licenses from a bar to, you know, to this thing that they call a catering business or from a restaurant to this catering, you know, terminology. Well, I think it's, I think that they're trying to cover, like what I said before, Mm. you know, say you've got a bar, but you're not allowed to open, but you've got the staff and you've got the, you've. Kitchen, you got the kitchen. For all intents and purposes, you could open a bar in another place, like a mobile bar. Like a food truck. Like a food truck. So I think they're trying to cut that out Ah. so that then you don't, you know, perhaps so you don't set up at Saigon Outcast and you you attract a crowd of more than 20 people. Ah, what do you think? uh, Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to read into. Yeah. So so the terminology is not very clear. No, not really. Ah. No. Then phase three is from January 16 and massages will be open. Massage. So what do you think of that, you guys? Yeah, I want to go. <laughs> to the massage. <laughs> legitimate, by the way. It has to be legitimate. What's yeah. legitimate? Uh, legit, well, well, what isn't legitimate? You tell me. Nah. Well, you know, uh, District 7 gets a win this week, uh, you know, in this long standing 
which is better district seven or district two, because we, we are actually in this, in this zone that we can go yeah, to the groceries. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so yeah. my friends who live in Cut Taudian that district are, too. Yeah, they're kind of spewing at but the But it moment. seems like they're getting deliveries anyway. Mm, yeah. So, you know, it doesn't seem that bad or for them. It's the bubble, right? It's just two is the bubble, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, so they operate in their own little territory. Right? Tell us. <laughs> yes, Anyone yes. Who's I'm laughing. I'm laughing. Yeah. This week, a post on social media caught my attention that I thought would be interesting to unpack, so to speak. A friend of mine posted an article that quoted a top Indonesian minister as saying, I quote, we will filter tourists that come visit. We don't want backpackers to come so that Bali remains clean, where the people who come are quality. End quote. Wow. The article with the clip bait Clit. <laughs> Clit bait. Oh, f- the article with the clickbait worthy title, Indonesian Minister Backpackers Are Not Welcome in Bali Upon Reopening, <gasps> published on September 13, also said that the Indonesian minister stated that Bali will move away from being a backpacker island and that Indonesian politicians want to target the more discerning traveller to shake off Bali's backpacker image. Wow. It was certainly an unusual move to come out and alienate potential visitors at a time when everyone in the industry is trying to work out how to get travellers, I assumed, of all kinds. Mel, you've been to Bali and Mm -hmm. I'd argue you're a discerning traveller, whatever that means. (laughs) Is Bali just for backpackers? Did you get that vibe when you were there? Uh, Well, as you mentioned at the top of the show, I am a flash packer, right? So. Uh, I think I've earned by virtue of my age as well, but I've earned the right not to, you know, not to go into a dormitory, you know, maybe pick a middle, middle of the, the road, like accommodations that I can afford, you know? So when we went to Bali, you and I went to Bali, we didn't stay at, at Kuda, right? Uh, We went to Kuda on a motorbike just to... Just for the day, yeah, I think. That's right. Yeah, that's yep. right. We're and in Ubud. Yes, we rented we were. a motorbike and drove to. We Kuda. went to two places: yep. Ubud and Padang Bai. That's right. Yes, yeah. and the places we stayed at and enjoyed, you know, the sites that were there. It wasn't as crowded with backpackers, and I think we we hung out with friends who are traveling as well, and they had a nice pool in their hotel. So we were we were just there. We were inside a, mm. a a hotel complex so we didn't i didn't really experience like loud drunk you know drugged out yep. uh, tourists it, it wasn't my what experience. time of year was it was it february um was it ted yeah it was ted yeah 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 so i think it was at the tail end of the australian high season okay i think the aussies turn up Sort mm. of from October November onwards but it's not Christmas. just it's not just the aussies who are like the customers of Bali, of course, they they have they are the majority. But no, I don't think that was my experience. It okay. wasn't our experience. And how about you, Andy? Have you been to Bali too? Yeah, but I mostly stayed away from like the big like Kuda area. I went mostly into the Gili Island. Mm. Uh, ah, I don't yeah. know if you guys have been there. Yeah, we've There's yep. like three different islands. Haven't yeah. stayed there, but cool. we we stayed on Lombok. Yeah, we did. And we did yeah. a day trip out to the uh, islands yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so that's really cool. But you know something I, I watched really recently, which is a doco that I, I think I believe it was on Four Corners. Yep. And one thing that really stuck out that reminded me of the trip was the process of rubbish on the island, or in this case, non-process of it, which is um, you know, it's a bit of a shame. Like You do see a lot of rubbish yep. like, in and around the area. Interestingly, a day later, on the 14th of September, a post was published online via the popular Coconuts Bali site that highlighted the Indonesian government's attempts at backpedalling from the minister's statement the day earlier. Mm. In the article called No Backpackers, Top Indonesian Minister Wants Clean Bali When Foreign Tourism Starts, a spokesperson for the government attempted to clarify what the minister meant by saying, I quote, Mm. What the minister really meant was a prohibition for visitors who violate health protocols and immigration laws. 
that's quite a backpedal. Mm. <laughs> it's not just Bali tourism that's thinking about banning backpackers or, you know, rethinking their tourism strategy. There was a, I read a recent article in the New York Times like a month ago stating that Amsterdam is, you know, is, is planning to change how they market themselves to foreign tourists after COVID. And they were saying that this is actually not a new policy that they want to instigate because the complaints from Amsterdam residents about overcrowding and disorderly conduct in their red light district started to crop up as early as 2013, you know, when tourism had fully bounced back from the downturn following the financial crisis of 2008. I think that's like the first tourism crisis. Right, okay. Yeah. So, but to be clear, you know, this reinvention is not just about curbing backpackers, but in general, it's about educating tourists that there are other places worth visiting in Amsterdam, you know, and offering alternative tourist activities. One of the alternative tourist activities that I saw in that article was like, marry an Amsterdammer for a day. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to click on the link, but it, 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 it wasn't working. And yeah, that was really interesting. I'm I wonder at- how that'd go in Pattaya. Marry a, a Thai lady for a day? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Andy. Wasn't that like a big sign that was kind of going around through all of the expat forums? It was like, this, it was in black and white. It was like, yeah, will you marry me? Ah, uh, yeah. Like for a Vietnam visa. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, the tables have turned. Yeah. They will turn, I don't know. But yeah, no, I think countries that are dependent on tourism like Bali is, it, it's kind of tough um, during the best of times to kind of transition your economy from like this right. cheap, Backpacker, mm. yep. digital nomad haven, yep. to more of a production or other service oriented kind of economy. So, yeah, really interested to kind of see and, and, you know, how they kind of do that. Now, I must admit, I'd never considered that this was an issue about backpackers. Mm. You know, whether or not countries have policies in place or think about imposing policies that actively exclude certain travelers, in this case, backpackers. So what I did firstly this week was create a poll on the Bureau's social media channels at the Bureau Asia to gauge some sentiment to see if this was actually a thing and I was pretty surprised by the results. I asked the question, should backpackers be allowed back to Vietnam as soon as travel restrictions ease? Now, apart from the responses, another interesting thing was that responses varied significantly depending on the platform. For example, on Facebook, 90% of respondents said yes, while on Instagram, only 33% Mm. of respondents said yes, which leaves 67% of respondents saying no, backpackers shouldn't be allowed back to Vietnam as soon as travel restrictions ease. Mm. Okay, disclaimer, it was a small sample size, but nevertheless, a sample anyway. What are your thoughts on that, Andy? Yeah, no choice. Vietnam's a country that's based heavily on the tourism sector. I think when I was doing some reading, I think it's like about 7.4% wow. you know, represents of the GDP. So mm. no choice. But I think they should, when I say they, I think the government or the authorities anyway should try to make it potentially easier for like digital nomads, quote unquote, uh, to stay here. And there's, a, there's some countries that have already done this. I think Thailand is one country that oh, okay. is like really open towards what that. Are the, yeah. What are the conditions for that? What, what makes a digital nomad, by yeah. the way? I mean, the definition of digital mo- nomad. Well, I mean, I think the de- definition of digital nomad is, is that you're able to run a business online um, mm. digitally, right? And okay. so, you know, you, you find a lot of affiliate marketers, a lot of bloggers, um, a lot of so-called writers online that you see. You know, they're the ones that, that are considered digital nomads, per se. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty interested to kind of see how, like, say, got other governments in and around yeah. Southeast Asia determine yeah. what is a digital nomad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, there's stuff like that, like trying to make it easier to kind of distinguish a digital nomad and to possibly make, it, make them stay here right. um, and make yeah. them easier to kind of create some entity, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which then enables them to stay, work. Like a virtual um, office, pay. yeah. Pay taxes if yeah. they yeah, almost if like that. needed. Yep. Yeah. yeah, 
Right, exactly. So, so then now they're contributing to the society and they're contributing. So they're not just here to like, you know, Yahoo, you know, do their jobs, but not pay any taxes here and stuff. Like, oh, they're they're able, like they're willing to pay taxes because they know that the money I make far outweighs like the minimum minimal tax sure. that I'm incur here. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. Look at Singapore. Singapore is one country where their, their tax is lowered to a point where it's like, oh, people don't even waste their time. Time trying to find ways to get money back from their tax. Oh right, to okay. Their tax, yeah. you know what I mean? Because the tax, the, the tax income is so low. Right. Um. So there's that. Also, like probably cleaning up, like the in, like quote unquote English backpacker teacher <laughs> sector. <laughs> okay. Section around that, yeah. you know, making it. You know, I think the government tried to do that earlier this year by, yeah. by re-looking at some of the visa um statements and then mm. hoping, and then you see people with the hoping to come back to Vietnam later. Yeah. Like that. And I think cleaning up that sector really, really helps because by cleaning it up, you, you, you mean, it means like good quality teachers actually do arrive and you're not, and it's making it harder for these like non-English speaking overseas countries um, or travelers coming in and, and trying to teach English. So, mm. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's ways to do it um, at the end of the day. Not long after I posted the poll on social media, our friend of the show, Dr. Nuno Ribeiro, got in touch and was very excited that we'd picked up the topic and told me he was in if we were going to talk about backpackers on the show this week. Wow, trending. Yeah, as regular listeners will know, Dr. Nuno, let's call him Dr. Nuno, hey? (laughs) <laughs> Dr. Nuno is a senior lecturer in tourism and hospitality at RMIT Vietnam here in Ho Chi Minh City. And he's a very active researcher in traveler behavior. So naturally, I said we'd love to have him on the show. So like in our previous episode a little while back, I interviewed him during the week and asked him about backpackers and backpackers in Vietnam. Great. So Mel and Andy, I'm going to Mm. replay some of the interview here now. In Mm -hmm. fact, four questions that I asked him. Mm -hmm. After each of his answers, we'll have a chat about what he says. Now, for anyone who wants to listen to the full interview, head over to our YouTube channel, The Bureau Asia, and give it a listen. It's well worthwhile with some very interesting insights into the potential future of backpacker travel in Vietnam. I'll make sure I add the link to our channel in the show notes. Okay, so guys, here's the first question and answer I want to share with you. I ask Dr. Nuno why backpackers are seemingly maligned within the travel industry. Dr. Nuno Ribeiro, welcome back and thank you for joining me again on the Bureau Podcast. Uh, Thank you so much, Matt. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, As always, a big, big fan of the program and I'm delighted to be here with you today. Great. So let's get straight into my questions for you today. And I have a few. Firstly, why are backpackers seemingly maligned within the travel industry? And in some cases, even among fellow travelers? Ah, this is, this is a terrific question, Matt. And something that we have, as researchers, have been discussing and debating and researching for a long time, more than 10, 20 years. I think there's the obvious stereotype, you know, they are budget conscious. That is true. They tend not to spend too much money. They tend to not necessarily speak the language or make any effort to speak it. And in Vietnam, that's quite difficult. Um, They tend to come from Western countries. They tend to come from privileged backgrounds. They tend to stay within their own bubble. And there's this perception they're not all that interested in the history and culture and the language of a given country that they visit, but they're sort of devourers of experiences, if you will. Uh, This is sort of the stereotype, Uh, but that's not necessarily correct. And that's been changing. We are seeing far more educated travelers with or without a backpack on their backs arriving in Vietnam, uh, arriving in whatever country they may decide to visit with a great deal more of knowledge about the country. They're armed with a variety of tools, something like, you know, uh, Duolingo that will allow them to get past, you know, the, the five or six words that you might need to get by on a daily basis. But even among fellow travelers, you know, to be called a tourist is sort of an insult. You know, you're not really devoting time to get to know the country, to get to know the people, to get to know its customs and traditions. And that's sort of the stereotype behind backpackers, you know, to be called Tai Balo is 
is not something nice. You know, it's, it's pejorative, it's, it's insulting. And I want to say, I'm not sure if this goes into the next question or not, but I want to say that the stereotype is changing. And in my view, it's changing for the positive. I'll start with you first, Mel. Do you think the perception of the typical backpacker as not being interested in the history, culture and language of the countries they visit is accurate? No. Uh, you know, not long ago we had what we call books, you know, <laughs> <laughs> i.e. the Lonely Planet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah the Lonely the rough Planet, guide, Rough Guide, yep. Travel Guide. On a shoestring, yes. Asia on a shoestring. So backpackers carried these books around them and left copies of it in their backpacker hotels, hostels and dormitory, yeah, right. yeah. you know, along with other books and magazines about the country that they were visiting. So I strongly believe that they educated themselves and others about the country that they were visiting. And, you know, coming out of this backpacker industry are the homestays. Right. Like, for example, if you went up to Sapa in Vietnam, uh, in the north of Vietnam, you can do a homestay with a family, uh, perhaps belonging to an indigenous uh, tribe uh, in, in, the, in their little small hamlet in the community. And so that is in itself immersive you know, your education, mm. you are learning uh, the, the local ways. You're not staying in a hotel where there's hot water. You actually go down to the well and draw the water out for your bath. You cook in charcoal, wooden stoves, and you eat, you know, with your hands, uh, with, with your family, you know, with the family that you're staying with. Okay. So, no, I, I do not agree okay. about that stereotype. Yeah. Um, Andy? Nah, I don't think that's accurate as well. Like, uh, you know, yeah, there's people that do come to Vietnam because of, you know, affordable. Yeah. But there's also a rich history of Vietnam that they genuinely want to explore. And yes, you do have those underliers uh, are here to party or here to find their life meaning journey, whatever. Totally fine, by the way. But like with any other country you visit, you're a guest, so you've got to behave like one. Otherwise, there is zero sympathy when you act and uh, he mentioned something about how they stick together in bubbles and it's sort of seen as a, a negative kind of thing. But Mel, you touched on it that that backpackers will stay at hostels yeah. and then they'll use each other as sources of, or the, we used to anyway, yeah. before the internet at least, you know, we never traveled with phones. But I can remember when I was traveling through this region that, you know, the first thing you do, one, you did once you checked in was to go down, uh, perhaps grab something to eat and see if there was a fellow traveller around who'd been been there for a few days or so, so you could get the lowdown on what was happening. Yeah, and I remember you were telling me that you kept on bumping into this couple. Yeah, because you, know? you tended to do this circuit. The same route, yeah. yeah. And uh, I guess it, it that was sort of instigated by these travel guides. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they gave you suggested routes and stuff like that. So it was quite typical to run into people sure. each time you landed in a new yeah. city or turned but, up. But I think people do travel in packs, you know, pun intended, because I think also for safety reasons, you know, you tend yeah. to see everybody, you know, booking the same hotels in the same area. And I think as human beings, it's just being with your same, the same kind, whether all of you came from a European country and you're all white or, you know, just the classic, oh, you have a backpack. I have a backpack. Oh, you're wearing flip flops. You're, you're wearing flip flops or tongs, whatever it is you call it in your country. But (laughs) it's like, you know, the strength in numbers, it's like group together. I think that's, that's, all there is, and there's nothing negative about yep. that. Yeah, it's a, it's very much a human trait for mm. when you you notice it when you backpack. You probably don't notice it if you're traveling through a package tour, but I can remember you turn up at a place that's foreign, and over your stay, you gradually move out further out and out mm. of your comfort zone. Yeah. So initially, you turn up where there's a whole lot of backpackers, and then you move out of eventually as you gain confidence. Okay, the next question is similar to the previous one, but I make it a bit more specific and relate it to Vietnam. I asked Dr. Nuno how backpackers are perceived in Vietnam across the spectrum, from street level up 
to governmental level. How are backpackers perceived then in Vietnam across the spectrum? So from street level upwards to governmental level? Overall, I still think that there is some of this stereotype lingering in the background. I mean, they are not necessarily seen as the most desirable tourists. You know, they're highly unlikely, for example, to stay in four and five star hotels. They're unlikely to eat, say, Michelin star restaurants or fine dining restaurants. But really, it depends on whether or not the person who you ask this question, you know, how they're perceived, whether or not they stand to make a financial gain from backpackers. So, for example, if you go to an area that's seeming with hostels and local eateries, they might say that, well, actually, we quite like backpackers. You know, they, they keep us in business. If you go, say, to the Museum of Fine Arts, they probably haven't seen a backpacker in a while. So it really depends on whether or not uh, there's financial gain to be obtained from the backpacker. Uh, at higher levels, though, it's a very interesting question because we're sort of struggling with this question, you know, what do we do with them? You know, Do we want backpackers, yes or no? Because with them, they are more prone to risky behaviors, be it promiscuous sexual behavior, be it drug consumption, uh, and so forth, which are not necessarily desirable in the host country. But at the same time, they do spend money. And in some cases, the length of stay of a backpacker may even exceed that of other types of tourists. They're also very good at detecting what's going to be the next big place, right? There's a reason why they're allocentric. There's a reason why they're explorers. You know, they might be the ones to figure out, like in the case of Vietnam, without backpackers, for example, we wouldn't have a variety of tourism services, say, in Da Nang. We wouldn't have a variety of tourism services in Halong Bay. We wouldn't have such a variety of tourism services even in Dalat because backpackers were sort of the, the first ones to go there in significant numbers to bring attention to that particular destination. At the government level, you know, that's probably something you want to ask government officials. But I think we, we're sort of in a quandary, right? Because, and not to get too technical, but when we look at the impact of tourism, Specifically, when we look at it economically, we look at three types, direct, indirect, and induced. Direct impacts are the amount of money that's directly spent by tourists, say, when they stay at a hotel, when they eat a meal, when they book a tour with a travel agent and so forth. Indirect is when elements of the tourism industry, it could be a hotel, it could be a travel agency, it could be a restaurant, whatever the case may be, an airline, whatever the case may be, when they themselves acquire goods and services, say, you know, they buy food, for example, to provide for tourist services. And induced impact is the overall boom in the economy just by the sheer presence of tourists and the overall circulation of money, typically in the form of foreign currency. Now, what backpackers bring, in addition to all, all of those three, and in some cases it can be argued, you know, yes, they do bring economic benefits, but not as much as regular tourists. They bring an additional fourth factor, which I call ancillary impact which are impacts primarily at the level of marketing and promotion. Um, I'll give you a common example. If you go on YouTube and put Vietnam tourism, the YouTube videos with the most number of hits, which are now in the millions, come from backpackers who visited Vietnam, who blogged and, and vlogged about Vietnam. They're the ones to promote the image of Vietnam. Now, our question is, Is the image that backpackers promote and share with the rest of the world, is that the same image that we want to promote? That's sort of the question. And it'll be very, very interesting to see. There aren't many backpackers right now, not to mention because the country is on virtual lockdown. But it'll be extremely interesting to see what happens post-COVID-19, which I suspect will be fairly soon, given the rate that things are progressing um, in a few months or even six months. What? will the image be that backpackers, at least the ones who stayed, that they will promote to the world, how that will contrast with the image that we want as stakeholders in the Vietnamese tourism industry? What do we want to promote Vietnam as what type of destination we want it to be? Andy, to you first. Dr. Nuno says that there's a question around, to use his words, what to do with backpackers. Do you think there needs to be time, energy and resources spent on working out what to do with backpackers? Maybe. It's probably more research into the different needs and wants of a backpacker uh, and what they want to experience. And then 
you know, there's a flow on effect, so it's making it easier and more streamlined to cater for it, but still maintain a local feel, because I think that's mm. part of that um, that romance that backpackers have when they come to a country like Vietnam. Like, they want to feel the localism right. um, involved in, in what, where they're going, what they're doing. So, you know, that um, also, some areas, it's more like, social sustainability so look at the environment I've been to you know I remember when I was traveling more being in some places like Harlem Bay for instance and seeing you know a thousand boats you know in Harlem Bay yeah, that's right. at night and you know all you can smell is really the petrol um, the fuel from each of those boats so looking at ways like the government looking at ways to for like social environment environmental elements coming in you know so you, you might see things that, like, oh, we're cheap, but we're not as cheap as we were before. Um, because, like, nowadays, like, governments or even tourist operators need to step up their game to become more environmentally friendly, to become more, quote unquote, like, new norm, um, catering to that kind of element of safety and stuff. Um, so you might see that. But I think, I think the government will have to step up. Uh, if they want to be a lot more serious about it. And there's a really good case, like Tourism Australia, and even the Hong Kong Tourism Board, they invest heavily into their tourism research and they provide all these great research documents to kind of help tourist operators, hotels and hospitality brands and organizations to really help define the persona of a key traveler and finding you know, potentially ways to do that from a backpacker's perspective or from different levels of travelers that come to Vietnam, their needs, their wants, you know, maybe it's to experience life, maybe it's to create a business, maybe it's to whatever, you know, but just having a persona and making it easier um, and that has a flow and effect down the line that's like, you know, from a judicial point of view, like how do we make it easier for people to create business here? Um, how do we evolve the banking system uh, so that people, when they come in, they're, they're able to bring their money over as well. Um, and that just helps the economy all, all around. Mal, there appears to be the question of the kind of mm-hmm. image backpackers project of Vietnam through their social media mm-hmm. and vlogging, and that it might not necessarily match up with the image okay. key stakeholders in Vietnam's tourism industry want. Yep. Again, is this cause for concern in any way? Look, um, I think if there is concern about the imagery that comes out, uh, then the Vietnam Tourism Board should really create ways to engage not just backpackers, but their local content creators. For example, mm. the Bureau Asia. Okay. Okay. Like, we are here. We've been living here for more than 10 years. And the reason why we, we are still in Vietnam is partly because, you know, we love the country and we, are, we have the local knowledge about um, the country. Sure, we, are, we live in Saigon and that might be our expertise, but the voices that are coming out from the local content creators should be what the government, i.e. the Vietnam Tourism Board, should be leveraging and not just waiting on backpackers' capacity to give them earned media on, you know, on, on, on their vlogs, on their websites um, and, and stuff like that. So. Aside from creating tactics such as promotions, contests, you know, hashtag this, hashtag that, where they invite travelers to help create uh, curated content for their communication channels so that they can, quote unquote, control the narrative. Mm -hmm. All right. I think they should invest in the people who are already here, the local content creators. Yeah. Now. That being said, it is hard to control a drunken tourist in Bouyvien walking street, you know, documenting him chugging his beer tower yep. uh, on Facebook Live while inhaling a helium balloon. Yep. Yeah. So obviously that that is a <laughs> we can't control that. So if they have a helium balloon, they float away. Is that it? Uh, <laughs> well, in terms of... I don't of, think it's helium. Uh, yeah, I don't no, think it's helium. No, it's not. Yeah, it's something else. Uh, but wait, you did mention, you know, floating away. I, I just want to add, I, I just want to tack something else to, to my commentary, okay. which is with regards to what Dr. Nuno said about indirect income. 
I, I have this perception that, you know, stakeholders are, are, are putting this category called indirect income from backpackers and it's, it's not important. Is it because there are no taxes coming out of this indirect income? I, I, I mean, that's the question I want to ask, you know, it's like, oh, there's a street vendor who's selling bottled water to mm. a backpacker. Yeah right? And there's a money exchange, yep. but uh, the street vendor might not necessarily be paying taxes to the government. For sure. And yep. so that's the kind of income that perhaps stakeholders are concerned about. Yep. That's why they want to ban backpackers because that money doesn't go to them. Well, let's be clear. They, they don't want to ban them, but okay. I think there's a discussion around how to who to market okay. towards well, to get to come to Vietnam. Same point, right? Yeah. So if you market to, you know, luxury uh, travelers or business travelers, who's going to book like 20 rooms at a five-star hotel for a conference or book, uh, you know, the entire resort for this expensive wedding that, you know, family and friends from all over the world are coming to? That's the kind of money that they want to keep. Okay, moving on to my third question for Dr. Nuno. I ask him what the cases are for and against encouraging backpackers back to Vietnam. What would be the case for encouraging backpackers back to Vietnam immediately after travel resumes? Well, first and foremost, because they are less likely to be daunted by risky situations. And let's not forget that COVID-19 is a risk factor, right? They're likely to want to travel, um, number one. Number two, they will travel in significant numbers. If Vietnam is one of the early countries to open up to tourism in Asia post-COVID-19, uh, there will be backpackers, be it from North America, South America, Europe, South Korea, Russia, wherever the case may be, willing to travel to Vietnam. And they do have an economic impact. And again, they have what I was just referring to, those ancillary impacts that will help the promotion uh, of Vietnam and the international stage to a great deal. And conversely, what would be the case against encouraging backpackers back to Vietnam? We may not want them here, to put it very bluntly. We may not want that image. We may want to give the the image that Vietnam is not for backpackers, that we want more upscale type of travelers. We want travelers that are going to manifest an interest in the history and culture of Vietnam. We want travelers that are going to repeat their travels to Vietnam, which does not happen with backpackers, for example. Backpackers see Vietnam very much as a bucket list item. They will come to Vietnam once and very, very rarely will they return. They might stay, uh, they might go to Bangkok uh, in Thailand, they might go to Vientiane in Laos, and they may do another loop through Ho Chi Minh City, but typically it's a bucket list destination. They will visit once and they will not return. We may not want that. We may also want tourists to stay for lengthier periods of time. We may want tourists to spend more money. We may want tourists who may not be as prone to certain types of risky behaviors. That may be the case. Guys, it seems that on one hand, backpackers are perceived to be not interested in the culture and history of Vietnam, yet they're lauded for what Dr. Nuno calls ancillary impact, uh, which essentially means the earned media that they generate um, from telling what are largely uplifting and positive stories about Vietnam. So whose side are you on at this point? Andy? I am going to sit on the fence <laughs> because I can see both ends. <laughs> sit in the no, middle. I can see both ends. Man. I can see both ends because backpackers, like the way Vietnam's been geared, it just caters towards that way. And for Vietnam to kind of begin to switch to this, like we want more, we want like higher end people. So we want like sorry, maybe a little bit less people, but spending more. Um, that's going to take a while. And for any country, like let alone Vietnam, and for any situation, let alone in this new norm that we are all living in at the moment. So a, a good case, if we went back to, like, you know, if we look at Australia, for instance, Australia spent a lot of time, a lot of money um, on prepping. Uh, it was first like Japan back in the 
late 80s, early right. 90s, yep. like that Japanese tourist market. And then in, in the like middle 2010s, or so early 2010s, it was all about China. And because China would represent such a huge amount of dollars coming into Australia. So it's like, how does, how does Australia sell itself and cater towards that you know, higher end market? You may be staying here a little bit less, but they're going to spend a lot more. You know, and so there's, there's, it took Australia like 10, over 10 years to kind of, you know, move away from the Japan market because they were seeing that right. like there was a decline in that. Okay. And then kind of moving towards like, you know, China. But I mean, just to say like they're only focused on China, like there was, you know, Australia did focus on America as well in yep. Europe as a whole. Um, but China represents like in terms of dollar per spend per travel. Like the ratio is so so high in comparison to the next type of travel that comes in, and that took a long long time for Australia to kind of move towards that. So that's why I sit on the fence. I'm like, all right, well, it really depends on where Vietnam wants to go over the next like five to ten years um, economically, and then it's going to have to be it has to be quite patient towards it. So for now, I would say it's all about backpackers. Let's try and get the volume back to what it is, um, but then also work in the background. To to maneuver that kind of higher end, um, you know, travel and more sophisticated type of travel that sees Vietnam that kind of Mel? For this question, I have to side with uh, the people. And when I say the people, it's not just the backpackers, but it's the people at the ground level here in Vietnam. The tourism dollars, whether, be it small, right, that the backpackers are bringing into the country, help prop up the livelihood of the normal street vendors, right? The two-star hotel, the family homestay, the, the Airbnb, the street food. And this money is going to a vast majority that may or may not be paying taxes, but I'd like to side with, with that with that economy, you know, mm. not the five star yep. hotels. All right. And so the backpackers frown as we may on their lack of finesse, whether they are interested in the culture or, you know, they're drunks, whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the money that they bring in is important to the normal people of Vietnam. And for me, that's what's important. Okay. And the final question I ask Dr. Nuno, are there any foreseeable impacts economically or otherwise if backpackers aren't encouraged to visit Vietnam? Backpackers contribute to local communities and economies as do travellers who fly in, stay at an international five-star resort for a week, then fly out. Are there any foreseeable impacts economically or otherwise, if backpackers aren't encouraged to visit Vietnam? Yes, I, I think so. Um, economically, I'll think, I think we will see a decrease in small travel agents, in domestic travel, uh, both in the case of airlines, trains and buses. We will see definitely a decrease in specific areas of what we call backpacker enclaves in large cities that have a variety of businesses dependent on them. And of course, we will see a decrease in the overall media attention given to Vietnam. Dr. Nuno Ribeiro, once again, thank you for taking time to answer these questions for me today. No doubt I'll have more for you to answer in the coming weeks. Until then, stay safe. Stay safe, you too, Matt. Again, it was an absolute pleasure. Take care. Mel, you first. Mm -hmm. Based on what you've just heard and what you've heard in the previous three answers by Dr. Nuno, do you think backpackers should be encouraged to come back to Vietnam once travel restrictions ease? 101%, yes. And why should travel only be for the privileged? I mean, it does feel like history is repeating itself. You know, like after World War II, uh, during the baby boomer era in the 50s and 60s, travel was seen as, you know, a first class experience. Remember that movie? Catch Me If You Can with yep. Leonardo yeah, yeah. Yep. and uh, Tom Hanks. Um, yep. Well, if this coronavirus is our generation's quote unquote war, you know, then after this war, I do expect that same cycle to occur 
for some time at least, you know, the rich will be traveling first. And then later, the so-called have-nots will get to travel again. And when that happens, open the gates. Andy, uh, will you be welcoming back backpackers with open arms? Yeah, I guess. I mean, small businesses in Bolivian will definitely buy the long pasture. Definitely, um, you know, you need backpackers because back, uh, they they help run the economy, um, and it's just part of Southeast Asia kind of tourism culture, like the ability for a lot of people from other parts of the country to be able to travel quite freely between different uh, Southeast Asian nations that are kind of shoestring up budget. You know, small businesses, F and B. Those kind of you know, these like cascading type of organ- organizations and little businesses um, and stuff and tourism operators. So yeah. Well, that's it for another show. Our seventh already for this season, How Time Flies in Lockdown. As always, Melanie Kasul, thank you. Put it there. Thank you. Wait, where's the uh, book and travel pun for me? What? You mean Mile High Club? Yeah. Okay, well, you can follow (laughs) Mel into the toilets for the uh, Mile High... No. You can follow Mel on Instagram at Melanie Kasul and all of the other Bureau Asia channels. And thank you, Andrew Tran. You're nearly out of purgatory, mate. I'm purified. That one purgatory <laughs> means. That's what purgatory means, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. You can purified. follow Andy on OnlyFans. No, on Instagram and LinkedIn <laughs> at Andrew Tran Digital. And you can check out Andy's new campaign marketing course he's just put together at andrewtran.asia. If you're part of a small to medium business and you're looking to up your game in the marketing side of things, check out all the details at andrewtran.asia. And finally, thank you for listening. I appreciate it and your support. Don't forget to share our work via our website, thebureauasia.com, and also from our social media channels on Facebook and Instagram. Where at, Mel? At the Bureau Asia. You got that right. (laughs) 